last few days in New Zealand, the 30 men chosen to tour South Africa got together for the first time. No games were played, but the All Blacks showed that with practice, they'll be a hard team to beat. Some of the men found time to visit Karori School to pass on their knowledge. The headmaster, wishing them luck, shakes hands with Botting, Wing, Henderson, Wing, Gudsell, second five-eighths, Johnston, side row, Elvidge, centre, Grant, back row, Kearney, first five-eighths, Skinner, front row, Mates, wing, and Catley, hooker. Wherever the men went, there were well-wishers, and though only a few braved the wet evening in Auckland to see them off, all New Zealand joined them in wishing the 1949 All Blacks the best of luck. Their first triangular tournament was held by North Island Training Colleges when Wellington, Auckland and Ardmore battled through four days of sporting events. Wearing tam shanters Wellington girls urged on their men in caps against Auckland. No goals were scored and the match was drawn. Picture, sir? Some sparkling form was seen in the tennis. Wellington's top man, A. Everett, plays B.B. Croft, Auckland's number one. The result was 6-0, 6-2 to B. Croft. Some neat and nimble action was seen on the sideline during most events, including the broad jump. James of Auckland covered 20 feet 3 inches to win the men's jump. Stacks of enthusiasm and plenty of zest were a feature of the tournament, but more outstanding was the number and ability of women entrants. Miss N. Pitt of Auckland made a throw that would have been a record breaker if she hadn't foot faulted. The winning distance of 28 feet 7 and a half inches coincided with the result of the men's throw. Ardmore girls in dark jerseys prepared to bat in a softball innings against Auckland. The result of the tournament was that Auckland defeated Wellington by 27 points to 19. At a tournament like this, teachers with long years of hard work ahead take a practical lesson in organization and mixing with their fellows. Later on, the whole show wound up with a dance. But when the Auckland catcher missed out, these girls had one on the spot. An enlightened education policy no longer forces children to ape adults, but rather helps them to grow up naturally. Five years of new ways in art education bore fruit in this Wellington exhibition of children's paintings. During its 21 days, local school children crowded the display, which was organized by the arts and crafts section of the education department, and comprised representative paintings by children from five to 16. The story of a child's development is akin to the story of mankind. Children's art that sometimes seems ludicrous has much in common with the work of primitive man. Sometimes children's talent falls off in their teens, and they never draw or paint again. This is only a passing phase, but perhaps because of this, most adults no longer express themselves in a way as natural as song. And as songs are forgotten when sung, so children don't care unduly about their paintings when done. This exhibition was an exception. These are scribble designs. A basic teaching method now is to let children work any shapes they like out of scribbling. This backs up the main idea in modern art instruction, to help the pupil develop all it has as well as it can. Children's art is important art. History begins with children. Cruising in coastal waters between Cook Strait and Banks Peninsula, units of the Royal New Zealand Navy carried out 14 days surface, underwater and air exercises. 
over a thousand men took part in ships of the 11th Frigate Flotilla and the cruiser Bellona. During convoy evolutions, an escorting Catalina attacked a supposed submarine shadowing the convoy, and the Navy tested their secret anti-submarine weapon, the Squid. Radar detected hostile aircraft approaching the convoy long before they came in sight, and a smoke screen was laid before the attackers arrived overhead. The operation was mutual, for it allowed the RNZAF to exercise aircraft in an airstrike against surface forces and for ships' gun crews in aircraft tracking. Close range gunners practiced their skills. miles off Akaroa heads, a floating mine drifted across the path of the squadron. It was sunk by small arms fire from aboard Bologna by anyone who liked to have a go. After three days at sea, the squadron put into Akaroa. In this safe anchorage, ships were able to rest their personnel who enjoyed the lighter side of the manoeuvres, a traditional naval regatta with intership sports. This was the first regatta held since 1939. A meet like this gives a squadron a chance to see old shipmates. The New Zealand station is wide and scattered and it's always a while before ships are together again. It was a merry time for the fleet. The weather was overcast and misty, but it in no way dampened anyone's spirits, though some did fall in the drink. <music> Proceeding from Akaroa to Wellington, the squadron refueled and put to sea again for the sinking by gunfire of the Hulk Occident. One of the last of the sailing ships, she was built at Glasgow 60 years ago for a firm in Hamburg. And the salvos from Bologna's 5.24-inch guns and single shots from the frigates, the Occident met her end. As she settled down in the water, a prearranged depth charge provided the coup de grace. All that remained now was this flotsam on the surface. The rest of Occident had gone down to Davies' locker. The war game over, the ships returned to their patrols among New Zealand's island dependencies and coastal ports. <laughs>